Good morning. It is a joy to be with you this morning at Creator Episcopal Church in Mechanicsville, Virginia, getting whacked with leaves along the way. A very blowing day, quite different from last week with all of the color. Things are changing a little bit now in the fall, but what a joy it is to be gathered together here electronically and in person that we might uh, praise and give thanks for the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we will begin, this is a, a service of Holy Eucharist Rite 2, we're on page 355 in the Book of Common Prayer, and we're going to start the service together with, uh, with a prayer and then uh, with the singing of uh, uh, three verses of hymn four, 680, verses 1, 4, and 6. So let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for the day. We thank you that you have called us from out our lives, from the routine of, of what we are and what we do and how we value ourselves, we thank you that you have called us to this greater value of love in relationship and in knowledge and a growth and understanding of who we are with you as we journey this life that you have given to us with the gifts and the talents that you have showered upon us, that you have given us the will and the ability to share in your name. We ask you to bless and sanctify this time, no matter where we are, because we are together in spirit in your love, and to watch over all those who uh, cannot be with us today, who are traveling or who are away, that they are, and we are with them in spirit as well. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Blessed Lord, who caused all Holy Scripture to be written for our learning, grant us so to hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you, with one God, forever and ever. Amen. Our first reading today is from Zephaniah. Be silent before the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is at hand. The Lord has prepared a sacrifice. He has consecrated his guests. At that time, I will search Jerusalem with lamps, and I will punish the people who rest complacently on their dregs, those who say in their hearts, the Lord will not do good, nor will he do harm. Their wealth shall be plundered and their houses laid waste. Though they build houses, they shall not inhabit them. Though they plant vineyards, they shall not drink from them, drink wine from them. The great day of the Lord is near, near and hastening fast. The sound of the day of the Lord is bitter. The warrior cries aloud there. That day will be a day of wrath, a day of distress and anguish, a day of ruin and devastation, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of trumpet blast and battle cry against the fortified cities and against the lofty battlements. I will bring such distress upon people that they shall walk like the blind because they have sinned against the Lord. 
Their blood shall be poured out like dust and their flesh like dung. Neither their silver nor their gold will be able to save them on the day of the Lord's wrath. In the fire of his passion, the whole earth shall be consumed for a full and terrible end he will make of all the inhabitants of the earth. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God. Psalm 90 can be found in your bulletin. Lord, you have been our refuge from one generation to another. Before the mountains were brought forth or the land and the earth were born, from age to age you are God. You turn us back to the dust and say, Go back, O child of earth, for a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it is past and like a watch in the night. You sweep us away like a dream. We fade away suddenly like the grass. In the morning it is green and flourishes. In the evening it is dried up and withered. For we consume away in your displeasure. We are away with your wrath indignation. Our inequities have been set before you and our secret sins in the light of your countenance. When you are angry, all our days are gone. We bring up years like a sigh, the span of our life seventy years, perhaps in strength even eighty. Yet the sum of them is but labor and sorrow, for they pass away quickly and we are gone. Who regards the power of your wrath? Who rightly fears your indignation? So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. The second reading is Paul's first letter to Thessalonians. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers and sisters, you do not need to have anything written to you. For you yourselves know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. When they say there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman and there will be no escape. But you, beloved, are not in darkness for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light and children of the day. We are not of the night or of darkness. So then let us not fall asleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who are drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober and put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has destined us not for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our, our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build up each other, as indeed you are doing. The word of the Lord.
please stand. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Jesus said, For it is as if a man going on a journey summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. The one who had received five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Though the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents and saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I have made five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with two talents also came forward saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made two more talents. His master said to him, well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent came forward saying, Master, I know that you are a harsh man, weeping, reaping where you do not sow and gathering where you do not scatter seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, have what is yours. But the master replied, you wicked and lazy slave. You knew, did you, that I reap where I do not sow and gather where I did not scatter? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and on my return I would have received what was mine with interest. So, take the talent from him and give it to the one who had ten talents. For to all those who have, more will be given, and they will have it in abundance. But to those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and the gnashing of teeth. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, in the, uh, in the last verse of Psalm 90 that we read together this morning, this verse, this is what it says. So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. So I remember last week we spoke about companionship. Our partnership in that relationship with God is the defining avenue of life. It is the defining process of life. So teach us to number our days. What does that mean? Who we really are. What we really do. Teach us. Teach us. To understand who we really are, not who we want, to be. not who we want to be. We've lost it again. <laughs> to become the people we want to be. There you go. I'm going to stop right here for a second, just define this one more time. If we think we are the people we want to be when we're not, it's because we know we can't be that person. I can't be the person I want to be. So I believe myself to be that person as a fiction. Only God can get us from the place of wanting to be that person and actually being that person. I'm going to ask you to join me in just a moment in a, in a line from our prayers, line from the, from the prayer book, uh, and you're going to recognize this, I think. And the line that I want you to pray back with me, which if you've been in the church for any length of time, you have done this probably multiple times. If you're a, a lifelong Episcopalian, you've probably done it hundreds of times. 
So you'll recognize it. I want you to repeat it back to me. And the line is the response to the prayer, three prayers here. The line is your response is, I will with God's help. Okay, you ready? All right. Will you proclaim by word and example the good news of God in Christ? Will you seek and serve Christ in all persons, loving your neighbor as yourself? Will you strive for justice and peace among all people and respect the dignity of every human being? Such a wonderful recitation and reaffirmation. Of course, you probably recognize it. If you don't, you're like, I know that. Where is that from? This is the reaffirmation of our baptismal vows. Whether you were a baby and were baptized as a baby and somebody, probably your parents, your godparents, said these words for you. If you were baptized as an adult, then you said them for yourselves. Every single time we baptize somebody, a baby, a youth, an adult in the church, these prayers are entered into by everybody in the congregation, stands and says these prayers over and over, I will with God's help, because these prayers are the reaffirmation of our baptismal uh, con uh, confess. This is our confession to the, to the relationship we have with God through baptism, uh, actualizing the promises of God in our life. Will you proclaim? Will you seek? Will you strive? I will, we say. I will. But how? With God's help. I can't be the person I want to be without God's help. I want these things. I will do them. I'm committed to them. But I need God's help. You know, the reading of the gospel today, as we read that, it's pretty brutal. <laughs> it's a pretty rough uh, uh, gospel with this lesson that Jesus has about this, uh, this third servant that gets uh, the bastard's money. He gets the talent. He buries it in the ground. And then he is uh, giving it back to the master, and the master uh, ridicules him in front of everybody and takes the talent away and throws him out into the outer darkness. Pretty brutal. Um, in fact, I would say that, that I've heard people say before that this is a, a, one of those um, embarrassing gospel lessons that is hard to deal with. And uh, I understand that on the surface, on the surface. But we don't stay on the surface, do we? That's not what we're called to do. We're called to go to a place where we understand what it is that Jesus is saying to us and how this is an important lesson for our lives. And so to do that, I want you to, to join me again back with the prophet Zephaniah. Uh, Lynn read that wonderful, wonderful selection from the prophecy. And this is by, by uh, the, the truth of it is an apocalyptic uh, uh, description of life, it's an apocalyptic end of life, an apocalyptic continuation of life that is held up by the prophet Zephaniah. So I don't know if you've ever done this. I have been in multiple gatherings with people, 15, 20, 50, 100, where when, when the gathering is about to start, because everybody is standing or sitting and they are talking about what they had for dinner last night or where they're going to go on vacation or or uh, how their car broke down and they were chattering and murmuring, then the, the, uh, the person stands up in front of them and may say something not unlike what Zephaniah said. And he says this, be silent. Now, of course, he adds this ending, right? Be silent before the Lord God. Now, if you're in one of those groups, like I have been, where you are actually waiting to hear what the speaker, the, the, the uh, keynote speaker has got to say, and you're chatting with your neighbors there in the seat, and the person stands up and say, come to order, or, or, or hello, or be silent, or let's all quiet down, what, what happens? You quiet down. Why? Because you want to hear. That's why you came. That's why you're seated there. That's why you're involved with these other people. You want to hear what's going to be said. You want to know that the authority that you expect on the part of the person who is speaking is actually the authority that you hear. 
And so Zephaniah is starting us by saying, you came here for this. Be silent before the Lord your God. This is the authority of the one who is going to be speaking. And this is what you came to hear. So calm your heart, quiet your mind, be silent in yourself and listen to these words. And then he continues, for the day of the Lord is at hand. What day is that? Well, from an apocalyptic perspective, it's the end of all time. The day of the Lord is when the Lord takes back all that the Lord has given and it's his. But what is the day of the Lord for your life and my life if it is not in the next five seconds the end of all things? What if it's not today? What if, what if we get all the way to tonight and it's not the end of all things? What is the day of the Lord for us as we live our lives? The day of the Lord for us is not necessarily the apocalyptic day that we are waiting for, or anticipating the end. The day of the Lord for us is every day. Be silent before the Lord your God, for this is the day of the Lord. As you live your life this day, be silent in yourself before your God. This God of authority and majesty, the one who, who owns and proclaims the ownership of all things. And then he continues, can, continues, the Lord has prepared a sacrifice. He has consecrated his guests. Now, we move forward in our minds and our spirits to the New Testament. The Lord has prepared a sacrifice, and we think, yes, what is it? From the very beginning, from the foundation of all things, the Lord has prepared the sacrifice of the second person of the Trinity, of our Lord Jesus Christ, to pay the debt for the sins that we have committed, for the life that we live, for the problems we've got, for the differences between us that we emphasize rather than the sameness between us, for the broken promises and the broken lives, for these things that are all on us, God has claimed us as God's own and has prepared the sacrifice. He has consecrated the guests. Who are the guests? You know, the sad reality is that the guests are, is not everybody who's gathered. We learned about that, or we heard it again just a little few weeks ago, didn't we, when we had the guy who came to, he was a guest at the wedding banquet, remember that? But he didn't wear the wedding robe. And the, and the, uh, the king came out and said, who are you? What are you doing here? He said, throw him out. In a very reminiscent of this lesson, right, in the gospel, throw them out in the street where there's weeping and the gnashing of teeth. I don't know you. He was not a guest at the, at the wedding banquet. He was there. He was in attendance, but he wasn't a guest. Because he was not a participant. See? He was a taker. He was a user. He wanted to come for his own purpose and his own reason and his own way. He wanted things for himself. He wasn't there for the relationship with the bride and the groom and the people and with the king. He was there simply for his own. So Zephaniah is saying the Lord has prepared the sacrifice for and consecrated the Lord's guests, those who accept the sacrifice, those who accept the gift. Those who are here participating with the Lord on this day are those who are sanctified by the Lord's sacrifice. So he says, be quiet and listen. This is what you're waiting for. This is the good news that you've come for. And then God begins to speak. I will search out in Jerusalem and lamps, and I will punish the people who rest complacently on their dregs. And when I first heard this, or when I first came across this word years and years ago, I thought, what's a drag? <laughs> what, what is a drag? They rest on their dregs? I, and I got it all mixed up. I remember in my youth, I thought about dreadlocks. And I thought, you know, these words are like the same as the same thing. What's a drag? A drag... Dregs are when you, when you crush the grapes to make wine, the dregs are the pulp and the skin of the grapes. And the dregs, a portion of the dregs are put into the wine vat with the wine. And from the dregs comes the color of the wine and a, and a jump start to the fermentation process. But this says here, I will punish the people who rest complacently on their dregs. Will, do you have that, the cover of the, of the bulletin? All right, so if you look at the cover of your bulletin, I, 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 have, I love to, I'm, I'm having a really good time picking out these covers these days, I have to admit it. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes I, I have to search around a little bit and find just the right one. This one was easy. This is a, a quote from Zephaniah. Uh, right here on the cover, but it's, I love the imagery of this guy sitting in his rocking chair. He is, uh, he's um, reading the newspaper. He's got a great view, doesn't he? Beautiful trees out front and a little bit of a rolling hill in the sky and everything is right. No worries. 
no concerns. Oh, it's all okay. It's great. It's great. Okay. All right. Keep that in your mind. There are so many like that on the internet. If you want to look up uh, this prop, this uh, quote from prop, from Zephaniah, there's a whole bunch of ones like this. So, who rests complacently on their dregs? So now imagine this. Okay, remember a few weeks back we had the the parable of the vineyard owner, who had uh, the the vineyard. He got the he planted good grapes and he got sour grapes. He got wild grapes instead. Remember that? Let's just take that same vineyard owner. Let's just say. The vineyard owner planted good grapes and he got good grapes and he takes those good grapes and he gives them to the servants and he says, make wine and I'll be back at time to get it because this wine has a purpose. This wine is going to be the wine of celebration at weddings and at baptisms and at family gatherings and at celebrations of all kinds at birthdays. It's going to be a joyful addition to what is going on. And so the servants, they take this good wine, this, these good grapes, and they crush it and they put it in the vat. And it becomes the good wine that the vineyard owner is looking for, that anticipates blessing the community in the celebrations of the community. And then the vineyard owner comes back on that day when he's supposed to collect his wine and he breaks open the vat and he takes the ladle and he sips it and spits it on the ground because it's vinegar, it's it's corked, it's bad, because the servants rested on their dregs. They left the dregs in the vat after they did their hard work to get everything done. Instead of coming back like they should have and transferring the wine to the other vat and leaving the dregs behind, they left the good wine in the vat and the dregs polluted the wine with too much too much acid and the fermentation process went wrong and the wine went bad. They rested because they had done a lot of work. I've done my work, I've paid my debt, I've got, I deserve my chair to sit back in and not do anything more. And meanwhile, that wine that was supposed to be a blessing to everybody is now a blessing to no one. In fact, the wine now is a curse. It becomes a drain, it has to be dealt with. And it has to be absorbed into the community as a loss. Maybe that was the only wine they had. Now in my wedding service coming up or my birthday service coming up, there is nothing there for the celebration. So the Lord says, those who rest complacently on their dregs, those who have received the process, the power to become that blessing to others and then rested on it, the talent that they've got, kept that talent to themselves, denied the community and themselves the exercise of the gifts that God has given. And that gift becomes nothing. In fact, it becomes a drain, doesn't it? A drain of lost opportunity, a drain of, of sadness and of lament later on. Oh, oh, why didn't I? Oh, my lost opportunities in life. Complacency. You know, there's, there's, uh, uh, there's a book called Dune. I don't know if you, anybody's ever read it. I read it years ago. It's like that thick, so I don't blame people for not reading it. It's a kind of a sci-fi book made into some movies. There's actually another rendition of it coming out. And the, the lead antagonist, the lead person in the book is, is Paul Atreides, who's going to be a messiah. He's a messiah figure. And at one point, he's subjected to this, this uh, pain, and he's in terrible pain. And he says this mantra over and over, and he says, he says, I will not fear the pain. The pain is a mind killer. And as I began to think about that years ago when I read the book, I realized there was two aspects to what he said. Pain itself, just pain in the moment can be a mind killer. I, it can be so great, so, so permeating that I am unable to, to work in the world around me. But the, the, the other thing that Paul said was not just the pain, but fearing, fearing the pain. I will not fear it. If I fear the pain, the pain I haven't even experienced yet, it will numb my mind. It will immobilize my body. I will be stuck and I will not move. I will be so afraid. I will not take the chance. I will not exercise the authority that I have. I will not share the talent that I have been given. Does this sound familiar now with the gospel? I will not share the talent which will benefit the community and bless the relationship. 
And who are these people? They are the people who say the Lord will not do good, nor will he do harm. So who is God to the people that do this? God is not God. God is not God. Whose description of our God is this? What person of faith describes our God this way? This is the God who will do no good, and this is the God who will do no harm. This is not a description of our God. Our God is an active God, a living God, a breathing God, a God who operates not only in the context of all human history, but in our lives personally, your life and my life, the indwelling Holy Spirit, the Sophia, the wisdom of God. What does, what does the psalmist say? What do the scriptures say? So teach us to number our days that we may apply in our hearts your wisdom. This is not this God. And then goes on to speak. Their wealth will do them no good. Their house will do them no good. Even down to this part where he says, they'll have to save up all this gold here. Neither will their silver or gold be able to save them. All these things are the things of the earth. When the day of the Lord comes, this day, terrible day of retribution, and they go back and they say, wait, oh God, excuse me, but I've got a million dollars in the bank. I'll pay you. I'll pay you for 20 more years. He says, this is not going to do any good. Your dependency on what you have well, do you no good? They shall not drink wine from what they have made. The great day of the Lord is near. Listen to these words, ruin, devastation, darkness, and gloom. Who are these, who are these words for? Nobody plans for a broken leg. Anybody? Broken leg? Anybody? We don't plan for a broken leg. We make plans against a broken leg. We have, uh, we have put our furniture in the same place in our house. We know exactly where everything is. You get up at 3 o'clock in the morning, you can walk pretty much in the dark from wherever you are to wherever you need to be without really getting hurt. We don't plan for that. We plan against it. This is why when you fall and you trip over the nightstand or the end table or something else and you fall and you break your leg or your arm, why it's such a shock. Nobody expects it. Who would expect that? We work against that. When Paul talks here, about the Lord coming like a thief in the night. It's a tantamount to falling and breaking our arm or our leg. Nobody plans for it. That's what he's saying. You can't plan for the Lord coming. You can plan in preparation for the Lord coming, but if we knew when the Lord was going to come, remember the scripture? He is, Paul is just paraphrasing the book of Revelation and, and Jesus when he speaks in Bark and in Luke, when he says, if we knew when the strong man was coming, we would have, or the thief was coming, we would have bound, we would have taken a chance, we would have held him back. We can plan for that event to happen. But when it happens, it's just as shocking as it was as if we didn't plan because even though we're planning for it, we don't know when it's going to happen. What is the preparation then? The preparation for the coming of the Lord is to live into relationship with God all the time. So that when God comes, it's a surprise. Didn't know it was going to happen today. But it's not unexpected. This is because... The design of our hearts and minds and spirit is a design in creation in relationship. Our God is not a monolith. Our God is not one single entity. Our God is a trinity of relationship. And we are born into relationship with our God and born into relationship with each other. We can't have it any other way. We can fantasize that we are alone. It's a wrong fantasy and it does nothing to to build us up, it breaks us down. We are not alone. We are never alone. We cannot be alone. We are born into relationship. And not just with our mother and father who participate with God in our creation, but we are born into relationship with every other human being that lives. Because all human beings who live are born into relationship with God. And through that relationship with God, we are in relationship one with the other. It cannot be any other way, and it isn't any other way. So when Jesus tells this parable about the master and the slaves, he says the master gave them, and by the way, this word talent that we have for our talents, I can sing, I can dance, I can put up wallpaper, that's my talent. This talent, this word talent is right from this gospel lesson. It's exactly where we got it. This word talent that denotes money, this, this resource that we have. So this owner goes and looks at these slaves and he says, I give five, I give two, I give one. And those two first two slaves saying, I am in relationship in two ways. I'm in relationship with the master from whom I have received the talents. 
And so I am owing back to the master to do what the master wants me to do, to share the talents, to receive a recompense for, rece for sharing the talents, which is the benefiting of the, of the community. They invest the talents in the community to get the interest, to get the repayment, and that, and that investment serves others, kind of like our bank, right? I put my money in the bank, and that money goes for someone else to buy their house, to buy their car, to rebuild. And so the money that I put there serves the community. The talent that they were given goes back into the community and then back to the master, except for the third slave. The third slave is not in relationship with the master. The third slave is not in relationship with the community. The third slave is in fear. Fear, the mind killer from Paul Atreides. The third slave says, I'm afraid of what's going to happen, so I'm not going to do any of this. I'm going to take this talent, I'm going to bury it. My talent, I'm going to bury it. It's not going to benefit the community, and it's not going to benefit the master. The relationship is not there. So the master comes and says, where's the, where's the recompense? He said, no, I don't, I don't have anything. Here is, this is yours. You gave me this for a purpose. But instead of using it for the purpose that you gave me, the relationship that I'm in with you and with the people, I am not using it. I'm going to give it back to you. Here, take it. It's yours. Take it back. This is a breaking of the relationship. And this is why the master then says, this is a worthless slave. Who is this slave? This is the slave that says, the Lord will not do good, nor the Lord do harm. The Lord doesn't do anything. If I don't do anything, the Lord doesn't do anything. If I stick my head in the sand and bury it deep enough, it won't, God won't do anything. If I sit on a train track within my chair with my paper and I look at the beautiful sunrise or the sunset or the birds flying ahead of me, there's no train coming. There's no worries. I'm just not looking that way. And as long as I don't look that way, nothing will happen. It's a denial of the relationship that we are given one to each other how we are to live our lives, how we are made from our bottom to our top, who we are as the people of God. You know, after this, this lesson, this parable, Jesus goes on directly after this in the gospel by saying to the people, the son of man is coming and what are you going to do about it? How are you going to live? You see what he's done. He has told this parable after parable after parable. He said the Maybe the guy who's in the bank won't understand the agrarian parable, and maybe the guy who's in the vineyard won't understand the banking parable, and maybe this other person won't understand this parable. So I keep telling this story in different ways, with different images and different illustrations, because I think you need to understand so thoroughly what I'm saying, because this is by definition the core of the life that you live. That you are in relationship with me, he says with God, with my Father, with all the Trinity, and through us, and by this definition, you are in relationship with each other. It doesn't matter what your skin color is, your political affiliation, or your opinion on anything. These things do not negate nor substitute the reality of your existence. And your existence is that you are in relationship with your neighbor. What do we say in the Lord's Prayer? What do we say in the confession? We ask forgiveness in our confession because we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We do not define our neighbors by the person that lives next door. Our neighbors are every other person created by God. And I don't know about you, but I'm pretty sure that there isn't a single person on this planet that wasn't created by God. I was talking with a man this week who said, I have nothing in common with them. I have no responsibility for them because we have a difference of opinion. I don't buy Cosmopolitan ice cream. Do you? You buy Cosmopolitan? You know, Cosmopolitan, isn't it Cosmopolitan ice cream? Like chocolate, vanilla, and strawberry, right? Neapolitan. <laughs> Neapolitan. It's got chocolate, vanilla, and strawberry, right? I don't buy that. I think it's silly. Sorry. I don't like strawberry ice cream that much. I think if you want to buy ice cream, I like buy a whole thing of vanilla or a whole thing of chocolate and just leave the strawberry off. Difference of opinion. You might love Neapolitan ice cream. You might have, you know, 10 pounds of it, 10 gallons of it in your refrigerator at home. That does not separate us. It sounds like a silly thing. 
And yet it's not. If my opinion is different from yours on Neapolitan ice cream, or it's different from yours on a political process, or if it's different from yours even about the God that we serve, it does not need to be the end of the relationship. In fact, it cannot be the end of our relationship. If we were wise, if we were learning from God, what we would find that this is actually the beginning of our relationship. It is the place where we should come together and find that commonality and find within ourselves the ability to discuss and discern and talk and respect one another. It can't be any other way. Any other way, any other way is to continue to be dedicated to be less than what we are meant to be. Remember that fantasy about we are being the people we want to be and not the people we really are? The reality is if we want to become the people who we fantasize ourselves to be, the only way to do it is through God, is through the wisdom of God. But you, beloved, are not in darkness for that day to surprise you like a thief of the night, for you are all children of the light and children of the day. The graph of rod is dest not destined for you, for you have found your salvation in our Lord Jesus Christ, Paul continues. So teach us to number our days that we may apply wisdom in our hearts, to know in our hearts that we are born into relationship with everyone, every one, and to live our lives in relationship with God through the Holy Spirit and with everyone is not a side dish. It is the main course. So important that we repeat it again and again and again as the staple of the life that we live within the context of our spiritual relationship in this world and with one another. You know the response, right? Will you proclaim by word and example the good news of God in Christ? Will you seek and serve Christ in all persons, loving your neighbor as yourself? Will you strive for justice and peace among all people and respect the dignity of every human being? I will, with God's help. Amen. Please stand with me. The service continues on page 358. Let us say together the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. 
that we all may be one. Grant that every member of the church may truly and humbly serve you. That, that your name, name may be glorified by all people. We pray for our bishops, priests, and deacons. That they, that they may faithful ministers of your word and sacraments. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world. That there may that be there justice and peace on the earth. Peace. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. That all of us may find favor in your sight. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble. That they may be delivered from their distress. Give to the departed eternal rest. Let light perpetual shine upon them. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. May we also come to share in your heavenly kingdom. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others. Gracious and loving Lord God, we continue in prayer and supplication. We continue in praise and thanksgiving of this day that you have given to us, this wonderful, beautiful, marvelous day of potential and possibility of miracle and wonder. We thank you that you have called each of us by name to this place and to this time that we might celebrate the sacrifice that you planned from the beginning of time and that you have consecrated and sanctified us that we might gather in your most holy name. We ask you to continue to open our hearts and minds and spirits to your presence. We ask you to bless and heal and bring to true life all those whom we have named on our prayer list, our family and extended family and those who are known to us alone. We ask you to be with those who are traveling this week or weekend for their safety and Lord, we pray and continue to pray for the young people of our parish family, young people everywhere who are suffering under the, the odd rhythm of this time of life. We ask you to give them wisdom, wisdom as to the potential and the wonder of what is possible and what lies ahead. We pray, Lord, now for all of those who are serving in the medical profession, for those who are sick from COVID-19 and from complications. We pray for those who apparently had recovered, but then now are, are having other symptoms and other difficulties. We ask for your presence and for those who are afraid to rely ever more upon you and your indwelling Holy Spirit. Lord, give us all wisdom as we order our life and our common life and as we seek in relationship with you to be in relationship with everyone else. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. On page 360, let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. And now, standing where you are, the peace of the Lord be always with you. Please be seated. So we will... Uh, we will continue in just a moment with the uh, preparation of the table and then the singing of the doxology. Um, Martha, you may have noticed, is not here today, but we are. She did send in the, the music for us, so we're, we're playing that as we can. Uh, a reminder for you at home who are on Zoom with us that when we actually end the service here for our YouTube uh, guests, that we will continue uh, with the Zoom meeting in order to talk about uh, the, the daily order of the church. So please don't jump off, stay on with us that we might 
make some announcements and, and let you know some things that we're doing right now that are of import to you in this week. So again, we will continue with preparation of the table as we anticipate Eucharistic Prayer A. Please stand for the doxology. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. For by water and the Holy Spirit, you have made us a new people in Jesus Christ our Lord, to show forth your glory in all the world. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite wisdom you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. 
On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ is died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son. The holy food of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ. By him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory are yours, Father Almighty, world without end. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. The gifts of God for the people of God. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Amen. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Amen. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Amen. <laughs> the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Amen. Body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. Let us pray together the post-communion prayer. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace, 
and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you this day and remain with you always. Amen. Alleluia, alleluia, let us go forth into the world rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia. It was a joy to be with you this morning. God bless you all. Have a wonderful and fantastic week.